evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking your time to come and listen to our presentations this evening. I'd like to start off by uh, thanking uh, two people in particular. The first is my supervisor, Brandon Collier Reed, who, uh, all the way back in the beginning of the year, allowed me to modify the scope of my project such that uh, I could build something illegal, which is probably not being done before. <laughs> and um, the other one is Ben Newton from Cape Town based aerial cinematography company Skyhook, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Uh, but has provided me with a pretty cool piece of kit, which I also can't show you uh, because it's, the cinema or the lecture theatre is actually too advanced for the piece of tech that I have, which is unheard of at UCT. <laughs> so, without further ado, uh, I have a long established interest in, in action sports, things like mountain biking, snowboarding, surfing, and uh, wakeboarding. Uh, the common theme between these sports is that it's very difficult to get up close and personal with the athlete as a, as a photographer, so it's difficult to broadcast and to follow them through the entire course, um, especially with wakeboarding and surfing the water. It puts quite a, a substantial difference distance between the competitor and the photographer. So then I thought clearly it would be viable to introduce a freely movable uh, camera system or camera platform. And um, since the 1800s, the late 1800s, various methods of aerial cinematography have been explored and I investigated these uh, quite in depth in, in my project report and I will expound briefly upon a few of them now. The first is the most rudimentary method in the pole. Um, it, is unfortunately, it is unfortunately limited by where the uh, operator is able to walk to and also is quite prone to shaking due to the, sort of the length of the pole. Um, the next is the kite which is superior to the pole in terms of its altitude capabilities but also obviously only operable in a small range of weather conditions. So moving on, uh, a quite interesting method is to uh, hang the camera from beneath the cable. You may be familiar with the Skycap system shown here which is in use in a lot of major sports arenas around the world. It provides um, nice flowing footage, you can get these nice top down shots on, on the athletes and the competitors but it, it is very semi-permanent in its installation so there's quite a lot of effort involved in having it set up. And if it wasn't like that, it would probably be a lot more <coughs> widespread in its use. Moving on to aircraft, the fixed wing aircraft provides wonderful uh, flowing, smooth, flow, uh, fluid footage. It's dynamic shots, you can capture wide areas, but you need a landing strip at the location where you wish to film. And uh, it has to be in motion for the entire duration of its time in the air. So uh, if, you, if you do like to hover, that is obviously something you can't do with this. On the contrary, however, a helicopter can hover. It has today proved itself to be one of the most successful aerial cinematography platforms. Uh, it is, generally speaking, a lot more difficult to pilot and uh, is a lot more expensive to maintain. So, recently there's been the introduction of what is known as the multi rotor. Uh, multiple rotors, anything more than one. Shown here is the octo, op, an, an octocopter, which has eight rotors, um, but technically speaking, anything with two or more rotors is a multi rotor. Um, anything less than four. Is, has a certain degree of complexity in its design, and anything more than four is sort of gets quite expensive. So, for this project, I elected to pursue what is called a quad, a quad rotor helicopter or a quadcopter. Uh, clearly, it has four rotors um, for, the, for the reasons I've mentioned, being uh, the cheapest, and also it is the it is the lowest number of rotors you can have with a rigid frame. So if you went to three rotors, for instance, one of the arms itself would actually have to turn to, uh, for one of the axes of motion, so that, that is an extra degree of vulnerability. Um, in terms of the camera for the project, I opted for the GoPro Hero 3 Black Edition, um, which is mainly because I had one right at the start of the project, and I didn't see any need to, to buy one. Also, it has a, a, a very slight frame and a low mass, so it's really not adding kind of a lot to the front of the the aircraft. Um, and then in any form of uh, photography or cinematography it's very important that the footage is stabilized and the device which I have elected to use for this uh, particular purpose is what's called a brushless gimbal stabilizer. So it uses motors on, in this case, two axes which move independently and they move to counteract the motion of the aircraft during flight. I don't know if you can all see this but it is activated now and as I move like this the camera stays perfectly level during flight, except for that, <laughs> anomalies, and um, so that, that keeps the footage uh, 
smooth and fluid in the air. In terms of uh, what you require for a quadcopter, <coughs> there's mainly electronic components, really the only mechanical components of the frame holding everything together, and the propellers, which of course hold to the top of the motors. So the first and most important aspect or component is what's known as the flight controller, really the motherboard or the uh, uh, computer controlling the whole operation. Uh, this accepts and interprets commands from the from the pilot, and um, the wireless receiver accepts these commands and relays them to the flight controller. In turn, the flight controller decides what each of the motors should be doing to keep the to keep the aircraft level, and it sends signals out to four electronic speed controllers. There's one for each motor, and uh, what these devices do is ensure that the motors constantly have the most recent instructions. So. Sometimes at rates up to 400 times a second, the motors will be being updated with their most recent instruction. So each of the motors, of course, has a prop, uh, propeller on top of it, and the entire system is powered by an onboard battery. In terms of the gimbal, which is really a whole, a whole uh, project on its own, similarly to the flight, to the aircraft, the flight controller has a controller of its own, which decides and interprets um, their conditions or how the camera is rotating and the speed at which it's doing so during flight. So there's a small chip, this red chip here, which is called an inertial measurement unit, which is mounted to the camera, and it records the speed at which the camera is rotating and the degree to which it has rotated. It tells the controller, and in turn the controller tells these two gimbal motors, uh, you do get a three-axis one, but this is slightly more simple, and it tells these two gimbal motors which way to turn in order to keep the camera level. Um, in terms of the what the frame and the gimbal are made of. I obtained carbon fiber reinforced plastic from a shipyard in Athlone and uh, tubing from a, a mast builder in uh, Montague Gardens, both for very low cost, which is quite beneficial because it is generally speaking quite expensive material. The electronic components I ordered online from a site called Hobby King. They took about six weeks to arrive and I was stung fairly badly at customs as I expected, but it was still about half the price that it would have been if I had bought the components in South Africa. So being a design process, uh, the design aspect of the project, sorry, being a design project, the design aspect of the project was arguably the most important. Uh, typically a quadcopter will be in the shape of an X and all the components will be piled up in the middle. So that is exactly, you know, it's, it's balanced around that point. Um, what I opted to to pursue was sort of more, as you can see, an elongated approach where the camera sits at the front, the components are aligned from the front to the aft of the aircraft, and the battery sits at the back. It's the single heaviest item, so it actually balances everything out quite well. Um, this is fine, provided that everything is still balanced around that central point. So what the frame must uh, make sure, what you must make sure the frame does, is that there's space for all the electronics on board, and also it should be strong enough for the event of an accident. So what my frame design, the, the process I sort of uh, followed was that I've animated it here so you can understand better, but the carbon fiber sheeting is sandwiched onto the arms, so essentially it's one big assembly and everything is held together by these, by these bolts um, and it's a big sandwich unit and with all the electronics in the middle, so it really it is quite clean. And then in terms of the gimbal, uh, sorry, in terms of the arm, it's a carbon fiber tube, which I, as I said, I got from a mask builder. And there are blocks of aluminium, because obviously it's difficult to mount a motor to a non-flat surface. So I've used blocks of aluminium, and I've clamped them down on the tubing. And this flat plate, as you can see over here, is where the motor is mounted to. So I've also animated this to make it easier to understand. It's really just a sandwich uh, assembly. And this piece of plastic over here is quite simply a piece of, of drain pipe from my house. Um, and, uh, which I cut out to the spare of my parents and um, it has proved very effective as landing gear. So uh, the design process really it would follow those steps. I, I modeled everything in 3D on a computer application and then I submitted those drawings and those models to the workshop and they fabricated them from the parts that, or from the materials that I gave them. Uh, in terms of assembly, there, there were a few modifications that had to be made to certain electronics before I uh, could fully assemble and fully fly the aircraft. The first was that the motor leads are standard were too short, so I had to extend those so that they could be fit uh, through the length of the arms. 
And next was that, all four of the electronic speed controllers, which I fitted to the bottom of the aircraft here, and I'm now connected to each motor. Those had to be soldered together, so that I had one point of contact between the flight circuitry on the aircraft and the battery, which you can, which you can swap out as it becomes flat, instead of four points and one battery. Uh, the next thing was that, uh, once I got the parts from the, the gimbal parts from the workshop, I screwed them all together to make a rigid assembly, attached the motors, and then I was able to mount it with vibration reducing sort of rubber on the frame. And lastly, the electronics, which you can't really see, but hopefully you noticed during the uh, animation, uh, were fixed to the frame using uh, double-sided tape if they required vibration reduction, or some uh, cable ties if they just needed to be, to be fixed. Once I had completed the construction, I was able to observe um, quite a few things, uh, especially during the first flight, uh, and, the first, and the first sort of five flights. Uh, and these, most of them were negative, obviously, and it's an iterative process, so um, it just gets better as we go along. But really, the first thing I found that some terrible mistake during my calculations led to the arms being completely incorrect in length. Instead of the, instead of the motors forming a square, it had sort of some collapsed triangle shape and the thing wouldn't even take off, uh, which is very disappointing. I couldn't understand why until I looked down at it and it made complete sense to me. Uh, the next thing was that during the assembly process, I was using a pair of scissors quite haphazardly and I managed to slip that antenna, which is arguably the most important part, because it's a remote control device. So the range was severely decreased from what I imagine would have been 250 to 300 meters to about around 70 meters. So if you see me flying it and it looks like it's gone more than 70 meters in the air, I would, I would uh, evacuate. <laughs> um, the next thing was that the tail section of the aircraft, um, which doubles as the battery bay, was quite poorly designed and you can see it's quite flimsy. So this was V1 before I uh, redesigned it. And the other thing was that the gimbal uh, had a lot of trans uh, vibration transmitted through it to the camera. And as such, the video footage is much less than desirable. So that's going to have to go back to the drawing board. What I eventually probably will do is redesign it now that I've got time. Um, <laughs> however, there were various positive aspects as well, it must be said. Uh, the gimbal works very well. It stabilizes the camera, as you can see. And as I showed you there, you couldn't see it. Uh, and in addition, I can, from my transmitter, turn this knob. And the position of the camera will, will tilt accordingly, so I can, I can film forwards and I can film uh, vertically downwards if I so wish. The next thing is that flight times, I'm sure this is something that everyone has on their minds, is between six and eight minutes, which doesn't sound really long, but for something this size and this weight, which is quite heavy, it's, it's not bad, although you, from commercial ones you might get 15 to 20 minutes. Um, due to some very terrible handiwork on the pilot's behalf, no name can be mentioned. Uh, I managed to find out that the frame is very strong after crashing it from a height of around 30 meters. This was a, a shot taken just prior to the terrible landing, um, which happened not flat, but towards the end of one of the arms. And if you look carefully on the embankment over here, you can see a Kieran Donnelly with his mouth open in amazement as he watched his ears work plummet towards the ground. <laughs> and it was very strong, all that rose as a propeller, and I was up and flying again within a few minutes. Um, lastly, in terms of the features, this device on top here is a GPS unit that works very well, I can locate it on a map, and I've also purchased a GP, uh, Bluetooth module, so I can actually, with, a, with an app on my phone, uh, while I'm in the field, I can modify settings, I can upload missions, and things like that, uh, as I see fit, which is, a, which is a great asset. In terms of the future, of, um, of the John Cocktail, so I'm going to see what's funny. The first thing to be addressed is that the Gimbal is uh, particularly shaky, so I will ultimately probably redesign that with an existing design, have it 3D printed, and then perhaps get some decent video footage, video footage for the first time. And then the flight controller had various features which I did manage to get working. Uh, the first thing was called GPS Hold. Uh, in which I'd be able to flick a switch on the transmitter and it would literally lock itself in position in the air um, at a certain latitude and longitude, which is very handy. Uh, the next thing is similar, called altitude hold, so wherever it is in the air, I flick another switch and it would lock to that particular height above the ground. 
which is also handy. So you could literally lock it in three dimensions and then film, you know, as you see fit. And then lastly, which is related to both of those, is a thing called waypoint tracking. So as you can see here in my neighborhood, I'm sorry, my parents, about the privacy issues, but uh, <laughs> 10 points on here, uh, which is a form of a mission. So you upload a mission, and it follows these points, um, and then well, it can take or follow the points, and then come back and land at my feet, which is pretty cool. But as I said, uh, it's all hypothetical at, at this stage. And then I had planned to fly the device, but at the advice of three separate academics who I trust, who I trust fairly, fairly well, they advise against it, partly because it's illegal and partly because it's incredibly dangerous and the judges are sitting in the front row and probably hurt my chances. <laughs> so what I will do is, I will just fire up the motors, but I won't obviously take it off the ground. I'm not sure you can all see this, you probably cannot, but if you can hear it, you know it's working, so you can trust me. Uh, so, I promise you, it's spinning. Can't you put it on the table? Uh, Can't you put it on the table? That's really all I can show you at this day. Unfortunately, due to the high-tech nature of this facility, I would have had a live feed from the camera, um, which one of you would have, been able, would have been able to see yourselves on a projector, um, but that didn't work either because it was from the 80s and uh, obviously I was a bit ambitious. So, that's what I'm able to show you. Uh, Thank you very much for your time, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions if there are any, and uh, I'm content to ask. Thank you very much.